How many of you have your Bibles? You got your Bibles? Good. All right. If you'll head back with me over to uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we want to be reminded of our, our theme verse as we go through these uh, sessions of questions and answers. And uh, I have one other one uh, for that will take part of next week, but I don't have any more. So if you want to add to them, then you need to be thinking about it and get me something tonight or at the latest on Sunday if we want to keep going. If not, that's fine as well. But uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 is our theme verse because whenever we are talking about uh, it may be strictly a Bible question, most of these tonight are just strict Bible questions about things that are in the scriptures or if they are about ethical situations or morality or, or you know, how should a Christian respond to certain things around us. Any of those things, we have to go back to the scriptures. The, the, the answer for us must always be what saith the scriptures, what saith God's word. Amen. And so 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 our, our, theme ver our theme verses, all scripture is given by God or breathed by God. It may say inspired, and that means literally God breathed. In other words, God worked through the different writer, whoever he was choosing to work through, whether it was Moses in the Old Testament writing in the, the Pentateuch or, or whether that would be the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, um, Dr. Luke wrote uh, Luke in the book of Acts, whoever it might be, we're told that all scripture is, is God-breathed and it is profitable for four things. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, or, or, or if you would, um, a, a rebuke. The next word is rebuke or correction. And for training in righteousness, that we might grow in the Lord, that we might grow in our understanding and our knowledge of the Lord. This is why the scriptures were given to us. So if we want to train and be more like Jesus, then we've got to get into the scriptures. There can be no growth in the Lord minus the scriptures. We can, we can say we have the Holy Spirit, and we do, and we want to be filled with the Spirit, but the Spirit and the scriptures work together. There's never a contradiction. There's never is there a time where there's a, the, the, the Holy Spirit saying one thing and the scriptures saying something else, because he is the spirit of truth, and thy word is truth. And so we're given God's word for these reasons, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be fully equipped or adequate. And, and adequate is not, doesn't mean average. It means having everything that we need, all that we need to do the good works. We are equipped for every good work that God calls us to do. So we need the scriptures. Amen. And we must always go back to the word of God when we are seeking answers to these questions. And uh, tonight, we're going to actually spend some time in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers, those two books in the Old Testament. If you want to begin by turning to Exodus chapter 3, give you a heads up as we start. So we'll head over to Exodus chapter 3, and I'll share the first of um, three questions. And the first question is, is broken up into uh, two parts. And Exodus 3 will give us our answer. So the, the question, the first question is, when Pharaoh, we know the situation about the, is, about the, the Jews, the Hebrews in Egypt, and that Pharaoh was, and the people of Egypt were ruling over them, had made them their slaves, basically. We know that situation. Um, and the question is this, when Pharaoh let the Israelites go, where was their final destination? Did they know that, there was, that they were leaving Egypt with a purpose headed in a particular destin or headed towards a particular destination and the second part of that question is why did it take them 40 years to get to that place and so kind of two separate questions but dealing with the Hebrews the the Jewish people leaving Egypt and moving on and we actually had the answer to both of those questions the first one is found in Exodus chapter 3 and we'll go ahead and begin we can begin in verse 4. The, the point of this is, this is when Moses is now in the wilderness. He has fled Egypt himself, and he's out in the wilderness, and uh, he's, he's tending to some flocks. And, uh, he, and all of a sudden he turns and he sees this bush that is burning but not consumed. That's the lead up to this. And verse 4 says this, 
When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look at the bush, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then the Lord said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians. And now look at this. And to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Parasite and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. And, and we go on. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, verse 10, and I will send you to Pharaoh so that he may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt so that you may do that, so that he would work through Moses to bring them out of Egypt. But you see there in verse 8, that the Lord tells Moses, this is what's going to happen. You're not only leaving Egypt, but there is a destination. And that destination is the land where all of these other ites live, the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, all these different people are in this land, but Moses would know what that means because he understood that this God that is speaking to him is the, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he would already know because this is, you know, hundreds of years after the fact, he would know that we're talking about the land of Canaan, all right, the Canaanites, that this was the promised land. This was the land that God had promised Abraham. And so he, he understood, Moses would understand where he's going to be headed. He's going to be headed from Egypt in a northeasterly direction to this land of Canaan where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob dwelt. Because why? Because this is the land that God had originally promised to them, to Abraham and his, to, his, to his descendants. And yet they have found themselves all these years later in Egypt uh, as slaves. And so, yes, there was a destination and they actually knew where God was taking them. They, Moses understood that, that this was God's plan, deliver them from Egypt and bring them back to the promised land, the land that God had promised Abraham and his descendants. Amen? So that part we know. And then the next question is, well, boy, why did it take them 40 years to get there? I mean, I know they're on foot, but if you look on a map and see, you'll see that it, there's no way it should take even, you know, a million plus people, the number, however, whatever the number was, there's no way it should take them 40 years to get from Egypt to, to what we would call Israel today. That shouldn't happen. So why did it take them so long? And that part of the answer is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. And we do have a definitive answer for that, why it was 40 years. Numbers chapter 14, let's go, to, let's go there. Now as the people are, are there and as they are moving through, they actually move pretty quickly past the Red Sea. We know that story. God opens up the, the Red Sea and, and delivers them there. And, and they're moving pretty quickly and they get to what we would call the outskirts of the land. And one of the strategies is let's send 12 spies to spy out the land, right? 12 tribes, let's send out a person from each tribe. And, uh, and so they do that and those spies go and the spies are there for a certain period of time and they come back and they report to the people of Israel, yeah, we've seen the land. It really is flowing with milk and honey. In other words, it's got everything that you would need to thrive. It is a beautiful land. This is a wonderful place. But remember when they came back that 10 of the 12 spies said, but there is a problem. The, the, the Canaanites, in other words, all these warring people, some of them gigantic to us, are in the land. And you know what? It's a beautiful place, but there's just no way. We can't take it. And if you remember, there were only two. Joshua, who else? And Caleb, only two of the 12 came back with a good report. And so what we read in Numbers 14 is God's response once these 
The, you know, because the majority rule, as it was, they, they, the ten overruled the two in the sense of their voice was greater and the people listened to them. And so the people are like, oh, well, we're not going in there. This thing ain't going to work out. And we see God's response and what goes on. And so let's just pick it up in, in Numbers 14 and uh, let's pick it up in verse 23 where, where, where the Lord is, is speaking to Moses. And the Lord says, these people, they should have listened to my voice at the end of verse 22. They shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valleys, turn to Mar and set out to the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I've heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, Just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses shall fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from the twenty years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into this land which I swore to settle you except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, well, I'll bring them in, and they shall know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds for forty years in the wilderness, and they shall suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. And now why? Why that period of time? According, verse 34, according to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days. For every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you shall know my opposition. So there is a specific reason that they had to just hang out there in the desert for 40 years. Because 40 days they spied out the land but 10 of them came back with an evil report and the people decided to believe that evil report. And God said, hey, you know what? None of you guys 20 and older, you've believed this. So guess what? You're going to wander in the desert for 40 years and none of you guys except Caleb and, and Joshua are going to enter the land. But all the people, all the younger ones, they will enter in. You're, you were saying, hey, if we go in there, these, all our kids will die. No. The kids will not die. I'll bring them into the land, God says. But 40 years, we're going to basically let all the rest of you, you're going to know what it is to perish in the wilderness because you did not believe. Now, you know, this is, I mean, this is a pretty big deal. Why is God so upset here? God had promised them victory. God had said, I will bring you through. These are the same people that had seen the hand of God in Egypt and had seen the power of God deliver them from Pharaoh and from Egypt. These are the people that had seen God part the Red Sea. These are the people that had seen God perform miracle after miracle after miracle and provide for them. And now God says, here we are at the cusp of you entering in. Go ahead and go in because I'll take care of the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and all the other ites. I'll take care of all of them. But guess what? They didn't believe. They lost faith. They decided to believe their eyes instead of what God said. And, and, and is this not the, the essence of our walk with the Lord? Right. Hebrews eleven six, 6, right? Yeah. What do we need in order to, to be pleasing to the Lord? By faith. It has to be always by faith because without faith it is impossible to please God. So it has to be. And these people demonstrated no faith. And so for the 40 days... Boom, 40 years. And God was, was true to that. And they did wander for the 40 years in the desert. And it, see, it wasn't, you know, we kind of get the impression that, oh, they got lost. They just got lost out there. They didn't get lost. God just said, no, I'm just going gonna, gonna to put you in here and you're going to camp out here. And there's another great lesson for us as well. You know, there are times where, where God wants us to move forward in something and our lack of faith gets us stuck in the desert. We are not believe in God and we're not willing, you know, we always say, God, you got to show me and then I'll go. No, 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 go and then I'll show you. That's faith. And so great lesson for us in this. Amen. 
And so answering both of those, uh, those questions, again, you know, were they going to a particular place? Yes, they knew where they were going, but 40 years because they were disobedient and unfaithful. They just did not believe the Lord would grant them victory. All right, next question in this same vein of, of Exodus and Numbers and, and the Exodus and all of that. Did Moses ever really get to see the promised land? Okay, why is that question being asked? Well, we go just a few chapters from Numbers 14 to Numbers chapter 20, and we'll see why we're asking that question. Because there's an event that took place in Numbers chapter 20. And we're going to quickly go to that. And so we're using our Bible tonight, and, and that's good. Again, that's what we talked about at the beginning. And uh, let's go to verse 5 of chapter 20, and we'll begin there. Why have you made us? This is the, the complaint of the people. They got stuck, and all of a sudden they're dying of thirst, and they're, they're all upset, which happened many times. And so the people are grumbling and complaining, and they say, verse 5, Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? There's not a place of grain or figs or vines or, promegan or, or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in front of the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. In other words, where the Lord dwelt, and they fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the, and let the congregation and their beasts drink. Okay, stop right here. There had already been another instance earlier where the same thing had happened. They were in a dry place and they had no water. And God had told Moses, I want you to take your, your staff, your rod, and I want you to hit the rock and water will come out. That was a different situation and circumstance. And the Lord worked because he told Moses, strike the rock, right? And, and water will come out. And so now, though, you see that God just says, I want you to speak to the rock and water will come out. Do you remember that? And so Moses, verse 9, took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? So now Moses is like, okay, you want to see this trick again? You grumbling people, I guess we're going to do this for you again? That's kind of his, his attitude right here. And Moses lifted up, verse 11, he lifted up his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. And water did come out abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me. Just like before, when the people didn't believe to enter the promised land, now all of a sudden God's getting on Aaron and Moses, because you have not believed me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Oh boy, so now all of a sudden, Aaron and Moses, who are the leaders, whom the Lord with Moses spoke as face to face. I mean, Moses had seen all the miracles. Moses had seen God do all these things. And now Moses lets his anger get the best of him, and in front of everyone, instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes it twice. And God is still merciful. He still gives the water. He's not going to let the people perish. He's going to give them water. But God says... You know, you didn't believe me. Interesting. And you didn't treat me as holy in front of these people. So you and Aaron, you're not going to see the promised land. Wow. Why is God so angry here? We get a little bit of a hint if we were to go, and I'm not going to take you to the scripture, but to 1 Corinthians. Because Paul tells us that uh, in the wilderness wanderings, the Lord was with the people. He led by a you know, a, a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And then, and then Paul says there was a rock there in that wilderness. And Paul says that rock was Christ. In other words, there was a symbol there that that rock was a symbol of Jesus Christ. Now, the first time that Moses came to this situation, God said, strike the rock. Jesus went to Calvary and died for our sins. But will he go again and have to die for our sins again and again and again? Only once. Once and for all, exactly. And when he comes again, he will come as king of kings and lord of lords. And Hebrews says he will not come with reference to salvation or, or, or sin, meaning he won't come to pay for sins again. He did that at the cross. 
One time he was struck. Every other time after that, now, when we have a need of the Lord, what do we do? We go in the name of Jesus and we ask. Jesus doesn't have to be struck anymore. There's no more crucifixion. It was once for all. This rock was symbolic some, in some way of Christ and of the holiness of God. And God wanted not only Moses and Aaron, but the whole of the congregation to know that the rock did not need to be struck again. All you have to do is speak and ask for the need and the need will be met. And yet God says, but you guys didn't believe me. So even in that moment, somehow, I don't know if it was doubt or, or what, I guess, entered into the heart of Aaron and Moses. And again, we say anger and it sounds like, you know, Moses was kind of angry and a little bit sarcastic and everything else. But he struck the rock and God took that very personally and said, no. And for this reason, you are not going to enter the promised land. And guess what? He didn't. Aaron died ahead of time. And then Moses, as they came upon the cusp of it, in Deuteronomy, Moses asked again, you know, Lord, you know, will you let me cross the Jordan? Let me enter in? And, and God said, no, I've, I've made up my mind. And so Moses did not go into the promised land. Joshua, of course, had to take the reins, so to speak, and, and, and lead the people in. But I will give an addendum to this, a PS to the question. Because, right, did, did Moses, the question is, did Moses ever really get to see the promised land? And the answer is, yes, really, he did. And when did that happen? In Matthew 17, when Jesus went up on this mount that we call the mountain of transfiguration, right? And Jesus was transfigured himself. He was kind of turned inside out. And that's why there was like a, a glow. There was a, the, Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. That, that that Peter and some of the others got to see. And there were two people that came and visited with Jesus and they spoke there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah the prophet was one. And who was the other one? Moses. So guess what? In a sense, Moses did get to see the promised land because God let him come back down to earth and see it. And of course, you know, he will see it again because he's one of the redeemed and we know that. But he did, in a sense, get to see the promised land. But it just took a little while. <laughs> Took a little bit longer, right? But he did. Amen? So we've answered that question. So now the third question is, why did it take the ten plagues? Why did it take ten plagues instead of just one or two or whatever for Pharaoh to finally let the people go from Israel? And we'll find the answer to this back in Exodus. So we'll go back over to Exodus one more time. And this time we'll go to chapter 8. Let's go to Exodus chapter 8. And I could actually take you to multiple chapters in the book of Exodus to answer this, but chapter 8 gives us really probably the most concise and the best spot to go to to, uh, to deal with this issue because there was a reason that it took 10 plagues as it was for Pharaoh to finally let the Israelites go. And we read about this, we read at the beginning of this in Exodus, uh, or, or a part of this in Exodus chapter 8, I should say, in the midst of the plagues. So verse 8 of chapter 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and he said to him, Entreat the Lord that he remove the frogs. This was a pl the plague of frogs. Things had, had gone from bad to worse. Another plague. This is a plague of frogs. Pharaoh says, you know, ask the Lord to remove the frogs from me and from my people. And what does he say? And I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, the honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your homes and that they may be left only in the Nile? And then he said, tomorrow. And so he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. All right, let's keep reading. And the frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people, and they'll be left only in the Nile. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs upon which he inflicted upon Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courts and the fields, and they piled them in heaps. And the land became foul. It started to stink. There were so many of them. But now verse 15 is the key. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, what did he do? He hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Because God told Moses from the very beginning, listen, I'm going to work through you or you and Aaron, if you would. And I'm going to show my hand mighty in Egypt. 
And Pharaoh is going to time and time again, he is going to harden his heart. God told Moses, this is the way it's going to work. This guy's going to harden his heart after each one of these plagues, and then I will harden his heart. As he hardens his heart, it's going to get worse and worse every single time until there's a big culmination in the last plague, which is the, the death of the firstborn. But the reality is, why did it take 10? Because Pharaoh kept hardening his heart. He would say, relent, to ask God to, to relieve, and then I'll let you do what you've asked to do. And then every time he went back on his word after the relief came. He hardened his heart. And, and that's how it began, the, the, the judgments of the early plagues. Mo, a, a little bit Pharaoh would soften his heart, and then when the relief came, he would harden his heart each and every time. After God removed the plague, his heart became hardened again. And this shows us that Pharaoh resisted God, and he hardened his own heart. And that's why I, I took you here to um, Exodus chapter 8. We see this actually play out multiple times, but I thought that was a good little summary there. So the point is this, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened. He was already hardening his own heart towards God. And so when God comes in and confronts him and confronts this stubborn, rebellious attitude that Pharaoh already has in his heart, then Pharaoh's heart is hardened all the more. And we go through this, this cycle of getting mad, hardening his heart. God brings heavy pressure down. Oh, okay, okay, I, I relent. It's just like, you know, your older brother or whatever and twisting your arm, say uncle. And you say uncle... And then you turn right around and call your brother a name, and then you've got to come back and twist your arm again. You know, it's kind of that kind of thing going on. But, but again, there's a very important spiritual principle here, isn't there? We have to be very, very careful. You know, the goodness of God, can I just say this to you? The goodness and the mercy of God is oftentimes it comes by way of correction, sometimes by way of you know, a spanking from a loving parent is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Sometimes a loving parent says there's got to be a little pressure put upon the child in order for them to learn. And, and here, not that Pharaoh was the child of God, but the people of God are there, and God's putting the pressure on Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has a chance to relent. Pharaoh even has a chance because Moses says, God will do this, and you will know that the Lord God is the true and living God. So even Pharaoh would have had a chance to deny the gods of Egypt and to turn to the true and living God. He's got Moses and Aaron, and seeing the hand of God, he could have turned. He didn't. He hardened his heart. There's a lesson for us, folks. When God brings correction in our life, you know what we have to do? We've got to humble ourselves. There, there have been you know, multiple situations that have occurred uh, recently in the Christian world, and one of them that is absolutely heartbreaking um, a, a, of a very well-known minister, um, apologist for the gospel, and did some absolutely horrible things. And yet, I really believe, if you look at the chain of events, because what he was doing went on for a long period of time, and when he was kind of confronted by the people that he had um, done some, you know, victimized, there was an opportunity for him to turn and to say, you know what? Yeah, that's it. It's kind of like, you know, when the police say, hey, stop. They got the guns on you. What are you supposed to do? Put your hands up. If you don't put your hands up, it can get a lot worse real quick. And there was an opportunity for this man to put his hands up and say, yeah, wow, you know, I, this is it. I can't take this any further. And I'm not passing any judgment. I'm really not. But I'm just, uh, he didn't. And it got worse and worse, and I, I don't know, but it seems to me that it would only be a hardened heart that would not only victimize people one time, but then turn around and victimize them a second time by calling them liars when they said, hey, this is what you did, own up to it, and then you turn around and sue them and call them liars. That, to me, is hardening your heart. You have an opportunity in that moment to do like King David. Remember when the prophet came and said, remember, Nathan, you're the man. Can you imagine if David said, no, I'm not, you're a liar. I didn't do anything, and I'll never own up to it, and I'll take you to court and sue you. <laughs> Nathan, I'm going I'm to have all, you know, Nathan the prophet, he don't have anything anyhow. The prophets never did, but David, you know, I'll hang you, I'll call you a liar. He didn't do that. He said, you're right. And, and so, you know what? When the Lord brings pressure to us in our lives, that's the time not to harden our hearts. 
The book of Hebrews tells us today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, and I know the application was not to Pharaoh, it was then to the people in the wilderness, you know, to, to God's people in the wilderness who were getting mad, and they were kind of hardening their hearts at times as well, and we've already read about it and talked about it. They didn't, you know, whole generation didn't even get into the promised land. So, but there's a thing here of a principle of that if you harden your heart, when God is, is trying to correct you, that often will pretty much lead to more hardening, and then to more, and to more. And hopefully, mercy of God, and we pray one for another, hopefully someone comes to a breaking point, and when they break, they turn back to the Lord. That's our prayer. But it can go bad, too, if you keep hardening your heart. And it can get worse and worse, as it did for Pharaoh. So there is a principle here that, Lord, help us to remember. Amen? and to, to go forward on. Okay, I'm going to answer this one last question, and I'm just going to give you scriptures. There, there are a number of scriptures, but they're all just uh, one or two verses. And the question is about the book of life. And so let's just deal with this real quick. What is the book of life? And can names be removed from the book of life? Okay, so, so I'm going to give you this in six points. First of all, what's the book of life? Well, the, the, the book of life is the key to where you will spend eternity. All right, let me give you a couple of scriptures. In Luke 10 and verse 20, Jesus speaking to the disciples who are all excited because they've, he, they've gone out on the mission Jesus has sent them out on, and they come back and say, Jesus, you're not going to believe it, but even the demons are subject to what we say in your name. I mean, this is unbelievable. And, and, and remember that Jesus says, hey, guys, don't rejoice in that. There's something else to rejoice in. And so Luke 10, 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, in the fact that the demons are subject and you're healing the sick in my name. That's all good. But he says, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written or recorded in heaven. That is the top priority for any person. Above everything else is, if there's going to be rejoicing in anything at the top of the list, must be that our names are recorded or written in heaven. Well, well, what about heaven? What is this book? The book of Revelation gives us a name. And Revelation 20 and verse 15 makes it clear that this book, and whether your name is written in it or not, is the key to your eternal, everything, is a, is your eternity is, is based on this. And this is what it says in Revelation 20 and verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, where names are recorded in heaven, it's called the book of life. And he says, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So if we want to boil all of salvation down to, you know, kind of like one question to ask people, right? Hey, is your name written in the book of life? That is the question that every one of us here should be, that's the question that needs to be answered. Amen. Now, all of us here, we know Jesus. Wonderful. Our names are written in the book of life. But you get the import of it. Because if your name's not in it, you're going to hell. Lake of fire. That's it. If your name's in it, you're going to heaven. If your name's not in it, you're going to hell. That, that's kind of good, isn't it? Because it's straightforward. There's only two places. Not 102, not 1,002. Not, there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. And, and so, and I'll get to you in a second, but so the key to, to all of this thing about the book of life is eternity. It's a big deal. It's not a little trivial thing. Our eternity is shaped by this. And let me get through these and then I'll, I'll come back for a question. So again, it's the book of life. Well, what do we mean by life? Can we define life? Yes, life here means eternal life. And where is eternal life found? We've been studying the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, right? We, we're covering this. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is what? In his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. So this whole thing of the book of life is all about, are we in the Son? Is the Son in us, meaning Jesus? Or are we not, and therefore we are not, in the book of life. Our name is not going to be found there. So that's point number two. Okay, number three. This is really important. Uh, are all people's names written in the book of life from the beginning of time? Did God just say, I'm going to write every person that ever lives 
in the book of life to begin with, and people that don't believe, I'll, I'll X them out. Is that how it happened? Or do pe are people's names written into it at the moment that they follow the Lord? It's, it's the second, and I'll tell you why. We know this, that names are written into the book of life. They're not automatically included because they're a human being and they were born, okay? They're written in. Psalm 69, 20, uh, 28 says this. And this is kind of giving the reverse of it, but it gives us the answer. The psalmist says, those that don't serve the Lord, those that are evil, he says, may they be blotted out of the book of life and may they not be recorded, literally written in with the righteous. So there's a, there's a, a point where they may be in there, but then he says, and may they not be written in. May they not be recorded. And then Revelation 13, 8 tells us the same thing. All who dwell on the earth will worship. We're talking now about the beast, the Antichrist. Everyone whose name who has not been written into the book of life. So it's actually clear that, you're not just, that there's not just a book of life with every person's name in it from the beginning of time. And then you might get blotted out if at the end of your life you don't accept Jesus. No. Your name is written in as you follow the Lord, as you accept the Lord. I think the scriptures are very clear on that. And that's an important point because people have a big difference on this thing of blotting out and all these things. Now, number four, who is written in the book? It's the names of the redeemed. All right. Again, Philippians 4.3 is another indication of this. It's not everyone, not all of humanity, the redeemed. Philippians 4.3. Indeed, he says, I ask that you help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. Um, and he says, and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. So Paul talks about fellow workers of the gospel and their names being written in the book of life. And then in Revelation 21, verses 26 and 27. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, meaning into the new Jerusalem, and nothing unclean and no one who practice abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. All right? So I think that's very clear. Now, here's the, obvi the obvious reversal of that, is that names that are not found in the book of life, there's only one destination. Hell and the lake of fire. We already read it, Revelation 20 and verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that answers that, and now here's the last and the key question. Can names be blotted out once they've been written in? Well, if we believe the Bible, yes. We go back, I'll give you one example from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. We were earlier talking about Moses. And at times he was pleading before God to not destroy the nation. Do you remember at times God got so upset with the people that had been led out that God actually said, you know what, I'm done with them. I'll, I'll wipe every one of them out. And Moses, I'll start over with you. Do you remember that? You can read it in Exodus 32 and 33, this whole big story. And I'm just going to give to you Exodus chapter 32, verses 32 and 33. And this is what is said. Moses is now pleading and saying, God, don't do this. Don't wipe all these people out. But now please forgive their sin. And listen to what Moses says. He says, but if not, Lord, if you cannot forgive their sins, then blot me out of the book you have written. And the Lord replied to, me, to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot them out of the book. I'm not going to blot you out, but I'll blot them out. And then one more scripture, Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. So Jesus says, no, if, if, if you serve in me, I, your name will not be blotted out. Your name will stay in there. So I think it's, it's very, very clear. Now, there are some that, that teach and say, no, no, everyone's name is in it. Because you see, here's the point. We know names can be blotted out. That's real clear. So there's no, you know, some people, a few people try and argue, well, no, you know, this is indelible ink. Once it goes in, it, you know, it can't be erased or changed. But it's, it is very clear that names can be blotted out. So some people say, well, no, everyone's name is written in it, and you only get blotted out if you don't accept Jesus. But that, the scriptures don't really teach that. They teach, number one, that names are written into the book as people 
journey through life and turn to the Lord or accept the Lord. That's how I read the scriptures. I won't have a falling out with someone if they want to disagree with that, but that is, I think, is pretty clear to the scriptures. And then the point is, and the implication with it, your name can be written in. Your name can also be blotted out. So it's a, you know, there, there is some seriousness to that. All right, so that is the way that I see that. We know what the book of life is. Recorded all the names of those that are going to go into eternity with the Lord. And names can absolutely be blotted out of it. There's, there's, there's just no question about that. The scriptures are very clear. Okay, so that is the, uh, the answer to, uh, to that question as well. And I will, get a, um, I will get a question here in just a moment. But I do want us to just quickly close in a word of prayer. And, and then we'll take a question. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. I do pray, Lord, that you would, these truths that we have talked about, Lord, they're not just academic. We're not just going through the Bible and trying to get trivial pursuit. These are all important matters. And we learn, we learn principles and, and promises in your word. And Lord, we thank you for the, the opportunity to study and to grow in you. And I pray we would apply these things in our life. And many of us here, Lord, we've, we are serving you and there are some here that we are praying for children or grandchildren. We're praying for them. Maybe to turn back to you. Maybe they've never given their hearts to you or maybe they have and they've turned away. We pray that they would turn back. We pray, Lord, that, that they would return to you and, and we're believing you, God, that you would do that and that, that more names would be recorded into the book of life. And Lord, that we realize as well that you're coming back soon. And that we're going to have all of eternity with you. And that, that's where our joy is. We rejoice in the fact that our names are written in heaven above all else. And we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.